I'm going to need you guys to fasten your seatbelts because I know I don't talk very fast and I'm going to have to pick it up. I like talking, uh, right now we're digging deeper into the Gospels, and uh, we want to do a, a nosedive and go really deep today. So uh, basically from the Gospels, we're going to be mostly in the Gospel of John. I want to bring a highlight, some of the history. Okay, so, uh, okay, everybody look up here. I don't want you cheating. I don't want you looking at your notes. All right. Does anyone know the name of King David's mother. King David's mother. What was King David's mother's name? You are about to find out. Her name was Nitzavet. N-I-T-Z-E-V-E-T. Nitzavet. Now, all of us know King David was a type of Messiah, right? Obviously had his faults. Okay, he's a type of Messiah. But let's take a look at some of these events here. <clears throat> In Acts chapter 3, verse 24 through 26, it says, yes, and all the prophets from who? Samuel. Samuel lived during the time of King David. He's the one who anointed him. And those who follow. So we also see Samuel was a prophet. As many have spoken, have also foretold of these days. You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Yeshua, sent him to bless you. And how does he bless us? He turns every one of us away from hell. No, he turns us away from our sins. Now, so let's jump back to Samuel. He was a prophet. Look at 1 Samuel 17, 12. Now, David was the son of that Ephrathite of Beit Lechem, Judah, named Jesse, who had how many sons? And he was an old man, Samuel was in Saul's day, and far on in years. Now, the three oldest sons of Jesse had gone with Saul to the fight. This is against the Philistines. The story of Goliath is in here. Okay, so Jesse has eight sons, and the three oldest are in the military. Now, look at Numbers 1, verse 3. All those of 20 years old and over who are able to go to war in Israel are to be numbered by you and Aaron. So how old were they before they could enter the military? 20. So if he has eight sons, three of them in the military, that tells you five of them aren't 20 years old yet. I'm going to tell you how to figure out how old David was when he fought Goliath. Okay? We already know that the other sons have to be younger than 20 because they didn't go to the fight. All right. Now, let's go to Acts 4.11. Here it's talking about the stone that was rejected by you builders has become the chief cornerstone. Neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now, it doesn't tell you the name, but what is that name? Yeshua. Right. Now, but... As David was a type of the Messiah, David is writing this. This comes from the Psalms, 118. And we're going to look at that because we're seeing here there's no other name under heaven given among men which must be saved. It's not exactly Yeshua, but it is Yeshua. But we got to go to this Psalm to see what name they're talking about. Okay, let's go. Psalm 118, verse 20 through 22. This is quoting that verse, so let's see what name it is. This gate of the yud Hey vav Hey. It's all in caps. That means it's the yud Hey vav Hey, into which ri the righteous will enter. I will praise you, for you, the yud Hey vav Hey, have answered me, and you have become my what? Amen. So... There's no other name under heaven by which man may be saved, but by the yud heh vav -He. Now, Yeshua is the yud heh vav -He. I mean, you can be dad, you can be pops, you can be grandpa. Okay, God has lots of names. Okay? 
But basically, it's the yud heh vav heh, and we know Yeshua is the yud heh vav heh. But this is where this comes from. And then it says, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. So salvation is only through the Lord, the yud heh vav heh. Okay, so I have up here, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. But I want to show you something from the Hebrew that you don't always see. This could also be translated as the stone which the sons have rejected has become the chief cornerstone. All right, well, it's like all the other sons of Israel rejected him as their Messiah. The Hebrew word for builders is bonim, and we know ben is son, and bonim is sons, okay? So this could also be translated that way. Well, let's go to the Gospel of John now, chapter 7, verse 3 through 5. We see his brothers said to him, well, go on up to Judea that your disciples may see the works that you do, for there's no one that does anything in secret and doesn't want to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. Okay? So even his brothers reject, everyone is rejecting him. Now, <clears throat> Yeshua, who is the son of David, he mirrors, David's life mirrors Yeshua's life. And I'm going to show you how. It's from Psalms 69. Psalm 69 David is heartbroken, and he's writing about his being heartbroken. This is David's cry out to God because of all the grief he suffered in his life, okay? I don't know how many of you ever studied David's childhood, but David's childhood was absolutely the worst life you could ever have. Most people only know him as King On, but I'm going to tell you about his childhood, Let's start. Let's look at Psalm 69, 1 and 2. <clears throat> it says, To the chief musician upon Shoshanim, uh, which means trumpets, it's a psalm of who? David. And look at his first phrase. Save me, O God. The waters are coming to my soul. I'm sinking deep in mire where there's no even standing. I'm coming to deep waters where the floods overflow me. So here he's, he's sinking. He's in trouble. And he's saying, save me, O God. <clears throat> now, look at this, 2 Samuel 19, verse 7, he's a lot older, but everyone knew what a troubled life David had as a kid. And look what this guy is saying. Now, therefore, arise and go forth and speak comfortably unto your servants, for I swear by the Lord, if you don't, there will not carry one with you this night, and that will be worse unto you than all the evil that befell you from your youth until now. Uh, people aren't connecting dots. He had the most horrendous life in the world, and you're going to see why. But I want to give you the scripture verses that back up what I'm about to tell you. As a matter of fact, look at John 15, 25 through 26. It came to pass <clears throat> that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without any good reason. But when the comfort has come, whom I'm going to send you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he's going to testify of me. Well, guess where that verse comes from in the Old Testament? Psalm 69. It's David's cry. He says, look at David. Get it. I want you to, your heart to get a hold of David's heart here. I'm weary of my crying. My throat is dried. My eyes fail while I'm waiting for my God. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. David was suffering literally. Yes, this was prophetic, but it was also pathetic <clears throat> that he is being treated this way. He says, those that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. Everybody hated David. Did you know everybody hated David? Look at this. Those that would destroy me being my enemies, what? Wrongfully. He had no reason to have these enemies, but those that were my enemies wrongfully are mighty. And then, I want you to think about this, real slow. 
then I restored that which I took not away. In other words, he's being accused of stealing something he didn't steal, and he goes ahead and gives them that, even though he never did it. Imagine that. If something was ever lost or stolen, David was the one accused as the natural culprit. And he was ordered, in the words of the psalm, to repay what I haven't even stolen. He would give things to people that he never even took anything from just to make the peace. All of his enemies are accusing him of being a thief. What's going on? Look at Psalm 69, verse 8. I become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children. Why would he be a stranger to his brothers, an alien to his mother's children? The word for stranger here is mutsar. Well, guess what? That word, the root word, is related to momzer, which means a bastard. He was the youngest, and all of his brothers and even his dad thought he was in a little illegitimate child from an affair that his mother had. That's why David thought it was he was the thief. He was the bastard child. Everyone, all of his brothers thought he wasn't a natural brother. Now, so everyone back then, oh my goodness, David is a bastard. That's how he was treated his whole life, okay? Uh, or an illegitimate offspring. Now, remember, David was already a Moabite through his great-grandma Ruth. But now he also feels like he was a, of a illegitimate birth. He's being accused of his mom having an affair with someone else. Uh, in Deuteronomy 23, verse 2 and 3, a bastard, and the Hebrew word there is mamzer, which is real close to mutzar, okay? Is not to enter the congregation of the Lord, even to how many generations? He will not enter the congregation of the Lord. An Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter of the Lord until their 10th generation. Ruth was a Moabite. And Ruth begat Obed, Jesse, David. He's the third generation. Who is David to even go into the house of the Lord? He's of the third generation of a Moabite. So, I mean, his, even Jesse felt like he was illegitimate because Ruth was his grandma. And it's to the 10th generation. He's the second generation. And so uh, there was this big problem back then. But uh, wait till you hear the rest of the story. I don't know if you knew this, but Boaz and Ruth had David. Historically, they say Boaz died the very next day. That night, Ruth conceives Obed. Boaz dies, and all of the Israelites were saying, see, you never should have married that Moabite woman. And so that's reinforcing the fact that Jesse marrying this, uh, or uh, Boaz marrying this Moabite, and then he dies the day after the wedding day? This is what uh, is in the Jewish encyclopedia, or whatever you want to call it. Okay, now, go back to Psalm 69, verse 11 and 12. I made sackcloth also my garment. I became a proverb to them. Those that sit in the gate speak against me, and I was the song of the drunkards. Okay, what about the Torah sages who sat in judgment? They always sat at the gates. And he says, those leaders of Israel were sitting at the gates, and they were speaking against me. They all knew, supposedly, that I was from an affair. Okay, and then it says, even the drunkards on the street corners taunt me. Even the drunkards are calling him a bastard. All right? So, I mean, what in the world did King David do to arouse such ire and contempt? See, I, I, <clears throat> the story I'm going to tell you, I want you to see there's a biblical basis for all this. He's being taunted by drunkards. Okay? The people in authority despise them. This is why... 
Psalm 51, 5, he writes, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. It doesn't say I was born in sin. That's a total misinterpretation by Christianity. What he's saying is my mother sinned when she conceived me because I was illegitimate. Are you get connecting the dots here? <clears throat> From the time of his birth onwards, David was treated by his brothers as an abominable outcast. Noting the conduct of his brothers, the rest of the community assumed he was definitely a treacherous sinner full of unspeakable guilt. And when David would return from the pastures to his home in Bethlehem, he was even shunned by all the townspeople. This is his evil youth growing up. <clears throat> Matthew 1, 18 and 19, the birth of Yeshua, the Messiah, was like this. For after his mother Miriam was engaged, before they even came together, she was found pregnant. Okay, so... Let's take a look at this little chart here. All right, here, Miriam conceives around Hanukkah in late December. Then it says she goes for three months at Elizabeth's house. No one sees her. Well, that's her first trimester. Okay, she may not be showing just yet, but getting close. But then what happens? You have Passover to Shavuot, her second trimester, and see, they hadn't come together yet, and everyone can see she's pregnant, and so they're wondering about Yeshua. So even in this situation, here she's showing before they even came together, because it had already been three months, and everyone likes to look when she's showing, let's calculate here, okay? So they all knew, and so Yeshua was also considered illegitimate. As a matter of fact, look at John 8, 39 and 41. Look how the Leaders treated Yeshua. Our father is Abraham. And you said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham didn't do this. <clears throat> you do the works of your father. And they said to him, we're not born of sexual immorality. Referring to him. We have one father, even God. Well, let's go to John 2, 16 and 17. He's uh, turning over all the tables. And he said to those that sold doves, take these things out of here. Don't make my father's house a house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of your house has eaten me up. Well, where is that found? Psalm 69 from David. He goes, the zeal of your house has eaten me up, but the reproaches of those that reproached you are fallen on me. It's a correlation. In other words, at this time, there was no one in David's life who would provide him love, comfort, and friendship. Is there no one? Well, let's go back to Psalm 69. Reproach has broken my heart. I'm full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was no one. And for comforters, I found none. So you're seeing how miserable David's life was growing up. This psalm describes the life of David as poor, despised, a lowly individual who lacks even a single friend to comfort him. Through no apparent cause of his own, he is surrounded by enemies who want to cut him down, even his own brothers or strangers uh, reviling him. Amazingly, this psalm is the voice of mighty King David, the righteous and beloved servant of God, feared and awed by all. This psalm refers to a period of about 28 years, from his earliest childhood until he was coordinated as king by the prophet Samuel. We are first introduced to David when the prophet Samuel is commanded to go to Bethlehem to anoint a new king to replace the rejected King Saul. Okay, <clears throat> how many kids did Jesse have, or boys? Eight. He had two daughters as well, but eight. But look at 1 Samuel 16.10. Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these, okay? And then, look at 1 Samuel 16, 11, and 12. Samuel says to Jesse, are the young men finished? Do you know why I said are the young men finished? Is that it? Are the young men finished? 
He phrased it that way because if he just said, do you have any more sons? Jesse could have said no. So Samuel purposely didn't say, do you have any more sons? He said, are the young men finished? And then uh, he goes, well, there's the youngest and he delights himself among the flock. And so Samuel said to Jesse, well, go get him. Well, we're not gonna turn around until he comes here. So he sends and brought him in and he is ready with beauty uh, of eyes, good appearance. And the Lord says to Samuel, rise up and anoint him. This is the one. So when he says, are the young men finished? Samuel really is asking prophetically. He chose those words carefully. Okay, if he would have said, are these all your sons? He would have answered, uh, yes. There were no more of his sons since David was not given the status of a son. Instead, <clears throat> Jesse answered, well, there's still left the youngest, or more accurately, well, there's a small one left. He's taking care of the sheep. The small one uh, left behind. David was not even considered one of his sons, and David's status was small in his father's eyes. Uh, he was hoping that Samuel would proceed and allow David to remain where he was, outside of trouble, tending to the sheep in the faraway pastures, but Samuel ordered that he come. Okay, well, look at Psalm 69 verse 21 at the dinner table they gave me gall for my meat and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink as david describes quite literally i was a stranger to my brothers a foreigner to my mother's sons here they put gall in my food they gave me vinegar to drink they even made him sit at a separate table they couldn't he couldn't even eat with the rest of the family he was treated as a bastard child now, look at this. How would you like to encounter a lion or a bear? Especially if you're a kid. Look at 1 Samuel 17, 34 through 36. David said to Saul, hey, I kept my father's sheep and there came a lion and a bear and, I took a, and they took a lamb out of the flock. So I went out after him and I smote him and delivered him out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Your servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be as one of them since he's defied the armies of the living God. Do you understand what you're reading? David was not permitted to eat with the rest of his family. He was assigned to a separate table in the corner. He was given the task of a shepherd because they hoped that a wild beast would come and kill him when he was sent to pasture in dangerous areas full of lions and bears. Why would a dad send a child out by themselves to take care of lion food, the sheep, when he's a kid? They knew he would encounter lions and bears and he's the youngest and they make him go take care of the lion food, the sheep. He is the small one. It was King David's mother, Nitzavet, who stood by the sidelines in solidarity with her son. She was shunned as well, and she also cried rivers of tears, tears awaiting the time when justice would be served. To understand the hatred that was directed toward David, we need to invest, investigate the inner workings behind all these events the secret episodes that aren't even recorded in the book of the prophets, but are alluded to in ancient Jewish literature. Before I showed you this, I had to show you all the background of the scripture so you would understand. Okay, as we know, David's father, Jesse, was the grandson of Boaz and Ruth. After several years of being married to his wife, Nitzavet, and after having raised uh, several virtuous children, he began to entertain personal doubts about whether he's Jewish or not. Even today, everyone's trying to decide, am I Jewish? Well, back then, he was trying to figure out if he was Jewish or not because grandma was a Moabite and they can't enter until the 10th you know, generation. And so during Ruth's lifetime, many individuals were doubtful about the legitimacy of her marriage to Boaz because the Torah specifically forbids an Israelite to marry a Moabite. Since this is a nation that cruelly refused the Jewish people passage through their land and they refused food and drink to purchase when they wandered in the desert after being freed from Egypt. Back then, it was thought that this law was forbidding even the conversion of male Moabites because they were cruel and they exempted the female Moabite converts, which is why they say she converted. But 
God commanded Samuel, arise and anoint David without delay. He's the one I've chosen. As Samuel anointed David, the sound of weeping could be heard from Nitzavet, his mom, David's only supporter and solitary source of comfort. Her 28 long years of silence in the face of humiliation were finally coming to a close. At last, all would see that the lineage of her youngest son was pure, undefiled, and finally the anguish and humiliation that she and her son had borne would finally come to an end. So here is what happened. Okay. Going to Psalms 118, the stone which the builders rejected could also be translated as the sons rejected. All of his, the sons of Jesse, rejected David. And Nitzavet is the one who exclaimed, the stone that the sons have rejected has now become the chief cornerstone. And now they respond in verse 23, the sons realize what happened and they say, this is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. Or this has come from God. It was hidden from our eyes. This is how Psalm 118 is being written. Okay, well, I'm going to explain all of this. But I think what's fascinating is how much has been hidden from both Jewish and Christian eyes imagining a Greek Jesus over the last 2,000 years. Look how much has been hidden. When David was born, this prominent family greeted his birth with utter derision and contempt. Let me explain. Are you ready to hear? What happened? Here we go. Oh, I got a few more minutes. I'm good. I was afraid I'd run out of time. I hope I didn't go too fast, but I wanted to make sure I got all this in. Here's how the, first I give you the legitimacy of all of this story. Now I'm going to, like Paul Harvey, I'll tell you the rest of the story. Okay, it is said that Boaz had died the night after his marriage with Ruth. Ruth had conceived and subsequently gave birth to their son, Obed, who was the father of Jesse. Some rabble rousers at the time claimed that Boaz's death verified that his marriage to Ruth the Moabite had indeed been forbidden. However, later in Jesse's life, doubt gripped his heart, gnawing away at the very foundation of his existence. If Jesse's status was questionable, well, he was not permitted to remain married to his Jewish wife, he felt. And it's a vet, okay? And so uh, Jesse decided the only solution would be to separate from her by no longer having uh, marital relations. Well, Jesse's children were aware that they had decided to separate. And after a number of years had passed, Jesse longed for an offspring whose ancestry that he felt would be unquestionable. His plan was to have relations with his Canaanite maidservant. And his thought was, if my status is blemished as a Moabite, I only have the legal status of a Moabite convert being forbidden to marry an Israelite. Well, I can at least marry my maidservant and she can marry a Moabite convert. Well, the maidservant was aware of the anguish of Nitzavet. And she understood her pain in being separated from her husband for so many years. And so the empathetic maidservant secretly approached Nitzavet and informed her of Jesse's plan, suggesting a bull counter plan. Just like Leah and Rachel, she did a switcheroo. And Jesse thought he was laying with the maidservant, but it was really Nitzavet. That night, uh, uh, Nitzavet conceived and Jesse never knew of the switch. So after three months, Nitzavet's pregnancy became obvious and incensed her other sons wished to kill their apparently adulterous mother and the illegitimate fetus that she carried. Nitzavet, for her part, would not embarrass her husband by revealing the truth of what had actually occurred like her ancestress Tamar, who did not want to embarrass Judah. Nitzavet chose a vow of silence. Jesse, being totally unaware of the truth behind his wife's pregnancy, but having compassion on her, ordered his sons not to touch her. Instead, the child that will be born will be treated as a lowly and despised servant, and this way, everyone will realize that his status is questionable, and as an illegitimate child, he will not marry an Israelite. So that is the story of David's 
youth growing up. And just like Messiah, he was not received by Israel. He was not received by his brothers. But I wanted you to see the depth of the pain and the suffering, how David's life paralleled Yeshua's life. Now you know the rest of the story. Let's stand.